Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. You're listening to Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Masser and Tim Stenevec on Bloomberg Radio. Hey, Carol, I don't know if you heard about this, but on Sunday, as it approached the narrow Bob El Mandeb Strait off Yemen's coast, a commercial ship in the Red Sea changed its destination signal. It's something widely available on the internet for most vessels, so anyone can see it. It changed it from an Iraqi port to all crew Muslims. I saw this. This is pretty cool. Yeah, the and change, they did it for a good reason. Yeah, the, this, <laughs> the whole point of changing this was a message to the Houthi militants of Yemen who say they're targeting ships linked to Israel and to its allies to pressure them over the war in Gaza. So the idea was, OK, well, our ship will be safe if we change our call signal and say, OK, we're we're all Muslims here, so don't attack us. Yeah, I think it's, it's incredible. Wild. All right. And then, uh, you know, you've got a lot of stuff going on in terms of concerns about Red Sea, uh, not getting around it. If you have to go a different route, the extra cost. And then there's also the drought in the Panama Canal. Needless to say, global shipping has been upended in recent months in a big way. Well, that's why we invited David Diker on the show. He's associate partner and shipping practice co-leader at McKinsey and Company. He joins us from Summit, New Jersey. David, good to have you with us this afternoon. You guys crunched the numbers at McKinsey. Uh, What's a bigger deal here? Is it the disruptions in the Red Sea or is it what's happening in the Panama Canal, which is having a bigger global economic impact? Well, first of all, it's it's great to be on the show. I've been a a longtime fan and uh, it's great to, to, to be speaking with both of you. Uh, in response to your question here, the answer is, uh, you're not going to like it, but the answer is both, right? Okay. You, you can't look at any of these in isolation, right? So when we were first you know, looking at the Panama Canal back in October, when they had started to announce some of the, the restrictions, you know, we had started to look at the numbers then. But then you know, when you start to compound this with the situation in the Red Sea, it obviously changes everything, right? So no shipper, no investor that has approached us is looking at either of these in isolation. All right. So, all right. They're all looking at it together. That makes sense, right? If you're running a company or an organization, you kind of need to keep your eyes on it. Um, Having said that, and I'm assuming some of your customers or your clients are reaching out to you, what are you saying? I mean, do they need to start making some changes longer term? Or, I mean, how do you assess a situation like this in in an environment, David, where I think it's safe to say over the last couple of years, we've talked about the pushback on globalization, more nearshoring, like how how are you advising some of um, the folks in your world, the clients in your world? Yeah, you know, the, the, the first question I usually get from a lot of investors is, David, when are we going to have a normal year in shipping? <laughs> Give up uh, on it. <laughs> and, and the answer is, I, I don't think that we will ever have a normal year in shipping. I, you, know, you always have to remind everybody, just as technology and you know the products that we manufacture are getting more and more sophisticated, the supply chains and the logistics that, that support them and provide those manufacturing components are getting even more sophisticated. Right? So the number one piece of guidance that we give to, to investors that approach us, to our clients that are manufacturing these goods is like, this is business as usual and will continue to be business as usual for the future. You know, this supply chain disruptions that last a month or longer are now becoming more and more frequent and on average are happening every 3.7 years. Right? But, ha- so, but, but how much are yeah. people taking that advice and actually saying, OK, I'm going to build a plant in my backyard or I'm going to make sure that I've got, you know, the ability to access either my supply chain, make sure that my suppliers are more locally based. Um, Like how much of that is actually resulting in action that changes how we've been doing things for decades? Quite a lot of it. And so there's two main things that we see a lot of our clients doing. The first is that they are elevating the importance of their supply chain organizations. And that means not only building, you know, the capabilities and the in-house technologies, and you know, a recent poll just showed with uh, our, our supply chain executives across a lot of our client base is that 98% of them uh, plan to increase their spend in supply chain related technologies over the next five years, which is very significant compared to, to pre-pandemic. The second thing that they're doing is just as you were alluding to, is they are starting to look at a longer term supply chain plans and starting to think through, okay, what are some of the strategies I need to have in place for events that I can't necessarily foresee? That means omnishoring, uh, or potentially looking at potential different routes that they can take to get to some of their manufacturing locations. Now, everything's on the table. So David, does it, I'm, I'm wondering, like, you know, obviously we understand the economic implications of this, but I'm thinking about, you know, other geopolitical 
associations or implications of this. I'm thinking about, you know, there are certain things that we can actually build closer to home, but there are certain things like commodities that just can't be. Uh, things like cocoa, for example, or, or, or coffee, for example, things that, you know, we rely on to be shipped from, from all over the world here. What ends up happening to, to our economy? I mean, do we all become more insulated? The push here is to become more and more resilient. Uh, and if we were to put this back in focus of the Panama Canal, you know, some of the, the, the commodities that you're mentioning there are going to be dramatically affected. You know, if you look at the Panama Canal, those economies that, that bear the brunt of this are those that are closest to the canal. Uh, and a lot, of those, a lot of those economies are very tied to perishable goods like bananas or other refrigerated cargoes there. And the answer is those things cannot just disappear. We have to reinforce and, and make those supply chains more resilient. And where we can't, ultimately, you'll see these companies have to increase the costs that they ultimately pass on to, to customers because it's just become more expensive to operate those supply chains. Yeah, it's interesting. And at a time when we know that uh, certainly the U.S. Central Bank, you know, we had another hot inflation print um, and it's just, you know, struggling to make sure that prices no longer are rising at the levels. We've, they've come down a lot in the last 12 months, but you do wonder about other stress points that either put a floor in prices um, as we sit right now. Having said that, one thing I think about, David, is I've been to the Panama Canal, I've seen it. It kind of blew my mind, having seen it in video and so on and so forth. Like you just realize the importance this is in terms of trade. Suez is obviously very important, the Red Sea too. The Panama Canal, are you starting to think about a world where maybe we don't have access to the Panama Canal because of climate change? No. Um, in, in conversations that I've had with major logistics providers, uh, investors and shippers that are that are tied to the canal for for economic reasons, you know, the canal is still a very critical part to all of those supply chains. Uh, and, you know, the canal can tell you itself that they're they're actively looking at various means where they're going to ensure that the canal stays open. It is too critical of, a, of an international trade pathway for for us not to continue to maintain. We talked Panama Canal. We talked Red Sea Suez Canal. What is the other geographical area that we need to have our attention to that we're not necessarily talking about, David? If I could answer that question, I don't think I'd be sitting in this seat. But is there anything uh, on your radar right now that you know, you're starting to see bubble up that is an area of concern, especially with, with climate change? You know, <sighs> Again, I, I, I go back to my, my original point here with these you know, our today's supply chains being so sophisticated and so so tight, or you know, a lot of shippers are still, despite you know what we went through in COVID, still want to go back to just in time inventories. Right. You know, it is any sort of disruption that could that could come right. to the forefront here. So I don't want to speculate what it right. could be, but I can tell you it it could pop up in in any place around the world. David, it sounds like that we as consumers have to get used to something that shocked us during the pandemic of empty shelves. And I feel like I increasingly walk into places and shelves are empty. Um, and maybe that's because of the just-in-time inventory. Nobody wants to be stuck with, with excess inventory. Is that a fair assessment? And just got about 20 seconds here. Sorry. <laughs> You know, I still I still believe that the, the sophistication of our logistics providers and the shippers out there will ensure that we won't have any stock outs here. All right. uh, so some but, optimism. Uh, we'll yeah. see. Yeah, time will tell, right? Um, David, great to check in with you. Nice to be talking with someone who's a fan of the show. So thank you for that. Um, David Dyker, he's associate partner and shipping practice co-leader over at McKinsey and Company, joining us uh, on Zoom from Summit, New Jersey. But I do think about supply chains, right? We continue to be talking about them post-pandemic. How many years are we out here in four years? And but it's not just pandemic, like it's pandemic, no. climate change, geopolitics. geopolitics. It's, oh, it's wild. Yeah, serious issues. All right, folks, don't go anywhere. I've got a special treat coming up in just a moment right here on Bloomberg Business Week. Okay, bear with me here. Take a moment and think about your life. Think about your daily routine and the built environment that you interact with. Your office, your workspace, the roads, the parks, public transit, all of the things that are around you and equally important, what you find on the other side of all the doorways that you walk through. Maybe it's just me, but these things have a huge effect on my life and my well-being. So we're really interested to talk with our next guest because this is their world. Andy Cohen and Diane Hoskins are the co-CEOs of the privately held global architecture design and planning firm Gensler. 
Gensler's got more than 50 locations and 6,000 employees around the world. In the Americas, Europe, Greater China, Asia Pacific, and the Middle East, they do more than $2 billion a year in revenue, and they count 80% of the top 50 Fortune 500 companies as clients. Needless to say, they got a good idea about what's going on around the world. They're also the co-authors of a brand new book out today, Design for a Radically Changing World. Andy, Diane, welcome. Good to have you here in the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studios. We're going to get to the book in just a bit, but we got a good chunk of time with you guys. Um, you have an amazing view on the global economy. Diane, just talk to me about how business is right now, what you're seeing. Hey, Tim, Carol, it's so good to be here. Um, wow, we're seeing that, you know, again, Things are, are moving quickly and changing from what we might have seen five years ago, and certainly during COVID. Um, there's, you know, we're we're in a world where um, you know new cities are being created. I won't say overnight, but you know, again, at such a rapid pace. Um, you know, we were just in India, and you know, to see the kind of energy and excitement going on and the transformation that we're part of as a design firm in Bangalore. We were just in Mexico City hearing a lot about the nearshoring and the, the energy that that's bringing to the economy there and obviously, <clears throat> excuse me, opportunities in the built environment as well. So, you know, again, as a global firm, we're part of this transformation that is literally happening, you know, around the world. We were at COP28 uh, and in Dubai, and you know, again, all of what's happening in the Middle East. So, you know, the United States. There's amazing things happening that hopefully we'll talk about as our cities are, are you know, finding their path. Uh, but but we're very bullish. Well, it's safe to say we have a sensitivity about cities too, and we think it's really important that if you have healthy cities, you have healthy countries and healthy policies, like it kind of starts at that level. But I want to dig a little bit deeper, Andy, because you guys do have this incredible global perspective. Any signs that there are companies or you know cities slowing down on projects because mm -hmm. of uncertainty about what's to come? Again, like Diane said, it's where you have this global perspective. We worked in over 100 countries last year. You know, we're seeing uh, the U.S. right now, in the, definitely in the work sector, in the office sector, definitely mm -hmm. slowing down. Mm -hmm. You know, we're in four sectors in our firm. We have work, lifestyle, what we call cities, and health and wellness. Mm -hmm. We're seeing our work sector definitely being hit right now with the slowdown in office, although we're doing a ton of uh, office to resi residential conversions right now. Are oh, you, wow. really? A ton of those right like now. Old, How, yeah, go ahead, like girl. old office buildings? Older office buildings, what we're seeing is because office buildings right now, they're only 50% occupied, we're seeing uh, this unbelievable flight to quality that's going on right mm -hmm. now, where tenants really only want to be in highly amenitized quality buildings that are brand new or newer. Right. And the older building stock, millions upon millions of square feet, what we call B and C product, are re or B and C buildings, are really, really a problem problematic. So what we have done, we created an algorithm recently that we're able to study entire cities or whole portfolios of buildings and analyze them quickly to see which buildings can be converted from office to resi. And about 25% of the building stock in the United States and around the globe can be converted. D Diana, how, how, I mean, we've heard for years since the pandemic that, oh, it's just too expensive to convert on a large scale old office buildings into housing. I mean, think about it from the perspective of the plumbing and there's some lack of windows. Um, I mean, how do you do this efficiently? Is it something that is realistic to do to offices that aren't used? Yeah, as Andy said, we've created a tool where we can answer that question really quickly. So some buildings it works and some buildings yeah. it doesn't. What's and in that tool? Like, yeah. What is it? No, it's, uh, you know, uh, we've put together basically a way of bringing all the analytics that would probably take, you know, a pretty extended period of time to study into a very concise set of metrics that predict the viability of, a, of an office building becoming residential. So the window to the core, mm -hmm. you know, that dimension. Obviously, super deep apartments are not going to work. Right. Um, you know, the floor to floor height. Again, you know, there are ideal floor to floor heights for residential <coughs> that are different in many cases than office. The loading dock, 
by the way, makes a huge difference. What's going on with, you know, the column bays? So all of this, cool. uh, basically we do a scoring and literally if it's 80 or above, it's viable. If it's below, maybe not so much. And you said that algorithm mm -hmm. says 25% can be reworked, which mm -hmm. makes me think that other 75%, do you think ultimately it's just gonna have to be either torn down or done away with? Well, we're doing a lot of adaptive reuses right now to other types of uses, but definitely okay. be, the reason why we're studying residential is as such a short as a residential. And so we need more residential, and this is a, a sustainable way of doing it. Instead of ripping a building down, right. we can reuse the building, which is so much better for the environment. I should also add, Diana and I just went this morning, we saw a project called a Pearl House, and it's here in lower Manhattan. It's the first unbelievable successful conversion from office to resi and it's, it was a building built in 1970 and we were able to literally turn it inside out and turn it from a standard office building into residential and we think it's going to be a home run here in new york it's pre it's really cool to hear about it's this great because hear again that, right? again yeah. it's like we, we've heard about we've been talking about this for years and it's like um it's good to finally see this happening so diane how uh, susceptible is Gensler to blips in the economy? Because the, re the reason I ask, it's, and I don't think it's an obvious answer, is because, yes, a big portion of your revenue does come from offices, but also a lot comes from municipal municipalities. You do airports, um, you do uh, courthouse renovations, parliament. Uh, so, so how much of that is dependent on you know, fluctuations within the global economy? Yeah, you know, over the last 20 years where we've been co-CEOs, we've really focused on diversification and really looking at all of the kind of a 360 right. from, as Andy said, sort of this work sector, which we've been talking about, that's the office buildings and then the spaces inside those buildings. But even that is like, you, you know, you've got tech and you've got financial services and, you know, professional services. But, you know, right now, one of our fastest growing practice areas is actually aviation. Mm. And, you know, you look at the stimulus, the, uh, you know, infrastructure bill that got passed not that long ago, you're starting to see amazing projects going on all over the U.S. in terms of these, you know, much needed uh, new terminals. We all go, you know, overseas and see great terminals, but we're starting to see some amazing opportunities here in the U.S. So, you know, again, that diversification, whether it's another massive growth area for us, is sports stadiums. And, you know, uh, again, we all just saw the Super Bowl, but, you know, it's so important in our communities to, you know, entertainment and sports as well. So, you know, the, and let's say hospitality. I mean, again, yeah. since COVID, we all know the hospitality sector has been just on a rocket and that reflects also back into the work that we're doing. Uh, let's get back to our guests, because still with us is Andy Cohen and Diane Hoskins, co-CEOs of the privately held global architecture design and planning firm Gensler. They've got a new book out. It's called Design for a Radically Changing World. Tim and I throughout the day have been just kind of having some fun even with the titles. I want to go right to one called Social and Racial Justice, because I think about how we have done in general housing. Uh, for decades and kind of separating lower income and then developers, maybe they throw a few units. Like, how do we do, and Diane, let me start with you. How do we do this better? Yeah, you know, it's about equity, right? Um, for so many years, you know, and in so many of our cities, there are communities that just haven't had the investment. And so, you know, at Gensler, we're really being mindful about seeking out opportunities to work on projects that are helping to create more livable streets, more green space, you know, helping to create schools that are, uh, you know, uh, exciting children to want to learn and grow. But, they but for not just one member of the social strata, correct? Yeah, for, exactly. For, for everyone. For everyone. For everyone. And it's it is about equity and how do we bring that through design? Um, Andy, you and Diane argue that design can be a more powerful tool than policy mm. when it comes to changing cities for the better. Explain. Well, sure. I think first let's talk about the context. For the first time in human history, more people live in cities than not. 55% of the world's population lives in cities. And by 2050, 70% of the world's population lives in cities. So the design of cities are obviously going to be really important for the global population. And we believe, and, I, and I, this has to do with policies moving forward, we believe in the philosophy and through our 
research of a 20-minute city. And the 20-minute city, and we learned this through COVID, is that everything is walkable. Everything you need in life, mm -hmm. every amenity that you need in life is walkable. Grocery stores, restaurants, retail, healthcare, education is all in a walkable district. Now, in a s small city, that would be 20 minutes. In a city like New York, you might have, you would have multiple 20-minute cities. But this philosophy of access and amenities, even having to do with uh, racial justice, is the idea that you have these amenities at your fingertips and about that design can make a difference in, these, in our world. How do you make sure it's affordable amenities that are within everybody's reach? Because that maybe is not always, I don't know if that's within design you know, capabilities, or is it? Like, how do you work that in as well? You know, again, at the end of the day, design isn't about the price tag. It's about the decisions that we make as designers. Where to put, you know, the green space. Where to put, you know, instead of a wall, maybe it's, it's shrubbery, or maybe it's the way that you move from one space to the other instead of something that's very rigid and, and kind of onerous. You know, it's about experience. And, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, design is, is about a, you know, a thousand different choices we make with the design problem. And again, I go back to, it's what we focus on. You know, it's what we focus on. Design is for every neighborhood in a city. But are clients all sensitive to that? I mean, I, I do always wonder, especially if it's a tougher economic environment, right? Tim and I constantly, here we are going through earnings still, and it's, you know, the bottom line, and, you know, what gets a stock moving? It's a buyback sometimes, or a dividend, or cost cuts. In these, you know, thank you, Mark Zuckerberg, the year of efficiency continues for many. So Andy, come on in on this. Like, when you guys are working on a project, mm -hmm. how important is it that it's access for most? How do you incorporate climate change aspects? How do mm -hmm. you do it? Make it greener, make it better. For our clients, they're looking for it all. They want are to make they really? They want to make sure that it's equitable, but they also want to make sure that it's financial. financial. And so um, we're constantly balancing the two. And I'll talk about housing for a second. We do a lot of housing. And much of the housing today, about on every project, 10 to 20 percent is affordable housing. That's being factored into the performance. Is that projects. more than has been in the past? Absolutely. Okay. Most Wait. most projects, residential projects, would have zero affordable. And now, based on the demographics of the community, developers are building that into their performance and make it work. And and that gives us the ability to create uh, you know equality and design to make sure that designs for everyone. Uh, Diane, Andy mentioned climate change, and uh, curious how you design in a world where extreme weather events are happening more frequently beyond just putting everything on stilts, because that's certainly one way to do it. But is that, I mean, is that the, is that like the only option for low-lying environments or even lower Manhattan or, or Red Hook in Brooklyn? Or do you not develop? Well, anymore? look, you put your finger on probably the most critical issue of our, of our time, which is climate change. And this is impacting all aspects of the built environment. You know, 40% of global emissions and CO2 are from buildings. Yeah. I mean, it's a huge issue. It's both how we make the buildings, We've the concrete, concrete and steel and We've all of that. About that a lot here. So this whole idea of, mm -hmm. of you know, adaptive reuse, that's, that's really, literally, we can cut in half the amount of emissions from our buildings if we can reuse buildings. So that's a big piece. And then, of course, creating efficiency in our buildings. So, you know, that's one piece of it, and you're bringing up resiliency. And the point there is that we have to think about the climate, not just this year and next year, but in the next 50 years. And so we need to create the systems and the design, the orientation of the building that is going to allow that building to be able to be usable and valuable into the future. I love that, this idea. Andy, come on, you got about yeah, 30 seconds I would left add, here. Uh, you know, uh, climate change is the moral and business imperative of our lifetimes. As Diane said, 40%, most people think that automobiles or industry are the largest. It's buildings that produce the most amount of CO2. We have put in place that by 2030, all of our buildings will be net zero. And that's really, really important. That's the focus for us. And uh, I'll give you an example of one quick project. San Francisco Airport, the first net zero, net mm -hmm. zero waste airport in the United States. So even publicly, like you were mentioning, Tim, it's coming. That municipalities are pushing for net zero. It's 
a nice thing to hear, an upbeat thing to hear, because it does feel like sometimes it's a tough climb, especially when it comes to climate change. Um, Andy Cohen, Diane Hoskins, co-CEOs at Gensler, their new book, check it out, Design for a Radically Changing World. Uh, it'll definitely get you thinking when it comes to your neighborhood and just developments in general. This is Bloomberg.